Okay, so let's start um, the invited um, talk of Ichkar. And as you can, could hear from our small chat, that was not intended for all the attendees, but we just had it. Uh, it was not planned to have it like this. We really hope to have Rujitsa in person in Paris, just like every one of us. But different circumstances will have us now to have the talk on Zoom. And uh, it's really my privilege to have uh, to chair the session of Rujitsa's talk. And Rujitsa's talk, it's a uh, um, research is very much within the core uh, areas of each cache. She's doing program verification, automated reasoning, reactive synthesis, and even recently looks into applying formal analysis of networks, uh, network systems. She has many awards. You can look it up on her um, uh, web page. And she's currently associate professor at uh, Yale University. So today, Ruth is actually going back to pretty much to her PhD work. And she's going to tell us about automated reasoning approaches about sets and multisets with cardinality constraints. And just like with any other talk Rujitsa gives, I have no doubt this will talk, this talk will be motivating, exciting, and a lot of entertainment. So just please enjoy it. And yeah, Rujitsa, the Zoom is yours. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Laura should know uh, quite a lot about this topic because I was working on that topic at the time when Laura and I were sharing office. And uh, that was really exciting time at the PFL. But don't worry, I won't just show you something that has happened. 10 years ago already, but you know, like I will also show you some newest results. And uh, as you probably could hear from a chat before, this is really such a great, uh, uh, exciting honor and uh, that to be invited to give a talk at Ichkar. And two days ago, John showed some very old uh, pictures. I will also show an old picture. And reason why Ichkar plays a really, and Kate conference played a really uh, important role in my life because this was a very first conference that I attended and I met many exciting people there. There are people with whom I still hope we can stay friends and which I'm very excited to meet at the conferences. So that's that's kind of disappointment was bigger that we cannot meet all in person. However, you know, like things are as things are. So let me tell you more what I will talk about. And uh, actually, my topic uh, will be uh, reasoning about sets and multisets with cardinality constraints. And I need to take you more like 10 years ago, uh, uh, more actually now than 10 years ago when this picture was taken. And uh, shortly after that time, I started to work on my PhD with Victor Kunchak. And this is a simple program that actually introduced and sparked this interest in the reasoning about multisets. See here is a simple program where you are just inserting an element into a list. So what is happening is you have a uh, you have a, a, a set uh, you have a set variable which is actually abstracting the content on the list, and you will insert a new element. And you can see here in front of you is a simple. Uh, a simple pre, uh, post condition which ensures that the content is an all content union, this new element that we inserted. So, of course, when Victor was showing me that at the time was this fame, uh, he had a tool called uh, J-Hope. Question was, of course, naturally arise. Yes, but if this is a set and what we are already inserting an element which is in the set. So here I also lied to you a little bit because uh, the full Post condition says the context is uh, all uh, content is all content union uh, of uh, of one, and the preconditions also have to say that the content all content didn't contain of one. Now, if you would try to insert two elements, the things are getting a little bit more complicated because not only that you need to ask for uh, that O one is not there, but in addition you have to say that second element is not equal to O one. And you can continue. You can see that your verification conditions will become bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, looking at that, my question was like, can we actually use multisets? So as you probably know, multisets are just like sets. Only element can appear multiple times. So looking at that, uh, question was like that we first then start to look at like, yeah, multisets would be really neat because in that case, that would be indeed correct specification and post condition. We would really say, look, there is a content Content is an old content disjoint union. You can do, or you can read it as a plus. Like I'm taking all content and I'm just drawing out this of one element. But then the question is like, what did we know about multiset? And at that time, we actually didn't know much. So we started to look where do multisets exist. And multisets did were active uh, area of research. They existed as a libraries both in Isabel and a Koch, which are interactive 
group assistance. Uh, they were very useful in nice for specifying and, uh, for example, sorting algorithms. So, multi sets was listening of buttons it was important however looking at that time at our automated reasoning community there were only a handful of papers like only a couple of them which were actually reasoning about multi -sets. so let me bring you somehow historically where we were so Kaloji Rosarba was working on decision procedures for reasoning about multi sets with but without cardinality constraints he defined uh, uh, all these operators on operators that we know on the multi sets as a uh, looking at the point uh, at, uh, on each element. But the paper which was more uh, influential for us was the paper by Lugie Sarpa, because what he did, uh, he actually looked in the multisets and he sport and with cardinality constraints. He didn't have a decision procedure. He actually showed that if you have some limited form of decision procedure, namely when you just count uh, uh, that, that if you just count the distinct element in the multiset, you could actually, that this problem is decidable, but what he actually said, like full uh, log logic of multisets with cardinality constraints, we do not, it's a stability. And he also stated there's an open uh, question problem, which is, uh, what is what do we know about quantified multiset formula with cardinality operators? So, this is really great when you're a just starting PhD student because there is a paper which actually states this is an open problem. So ever, ever after it, you're just like, we solve an open problem, we solve an open problem. But now uh, let's go what, uh, to tell you more what we, will, what we did and which, what this talk will be uh, about. So um, what we did, we actually look into multisets with cardinality constraints in the language that I will show sh uh, shortly. Uh, and we uh, describe its decidability. We also uh, we had to introduce something semilinear sets, and we use we actually show that this is exactly uh, as complicated as using set. The both problems are cassettes with cardinality constraints and solving uh, multisets with cardinality constraints. The both problems are NP complete, and we actually constructed uh, we had a tool which are called which I called Munket. Uh, and that tool was actually taking this decision procedure and generating very large uh, polynomial li uh, linear integer arithmetic formula and then trying to solve these formulas uh, uh, that, that we were considering. The problem with this tool and with decision procedure was like we had sound, we proved soundness, completeness and everything. It all goes with that, but it didn't scale. So move things uh, 10 years later and actually last year at, uh, in Georgia, uh, Nicole and I started to look into how actually you could make this approach scalable. And what we did, we actually outlined a first efficient decision procedure for this, uh, for reasoning about multi sets with cardinality constraints. And that's actually what my talk will be focused on. First, I will introduce you. Uh, first, I will introduce you to the problem of multi sets, and then I will show you how actually you can, for all this insight that you learned previously, once you have eager students who are ready to implement that you can really make this scalable. So let's actually now start with a formal definition of the multisets. If you look at the example here, you will see you have CT two multisets. One multiset contains three, three A's and two C's, and the other multiset contains A's and C, only A and C. On the multiset level, they're different. On the set level, they're the same. Both of them just contain A and C. So formally, multiset will be a function from this uh, universe that we use for populating E, so function from uh, E to just set of uh, non-negative integer. In this particular case, multiset M1 is a function that goes from E, and this is defined as you can see, and in case M2, multiset uh, or a set uh, 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 M2 is defined with the function M2. Now, uh, Looking at that, I also promised you that we have a very expressive logic. So here is a picture of the logic I, uh, that you that we are considering. This logic is also the picture is also in the paper. So if you want to uh, ask more questions or look into this, what we can support. But let me actually just guide you a little bit. We support all Boolean combinators. And the uh, atoms are actually formulas that are talking about multisets that you can actually compare to multisets or uh, look for the for whether one is subset of another standard thing as in the set. But we also have universally quantified formula 
which are actually only universally quantified over all elements. So uh, you can see that this, for this reason, we have to distinguish formulas because we cannot just say here is the full universally quantified uh, power formula. This is restricted version where we talk what holds about all elements. Now, this was very important. Let me, uh, I, I will show you the next example, but you can actually see from multi-set expression, we, you can have empty multi-sets, multi variables, uh, intersection, union, disjoint union, set difference, multi difference, and we can also have step operator, which takes a multi -set and convert it into a set. Now, looking uh, into more example, what, what that would be like, let me look into this disjoint union that I already mentioned. So what does it say? It's like you have two, multi uh, well, three multi-set and if you take multi-set M2 and multi-set M3 and you disjoint and you actually call this M1, that actually means looking back on the definition because definitions are of the functions level that for every element, multiplicity of this element uh, of, of in, in M1 will be actually you check how many times it appeared in M2 and how many times in M3 and you just add that. Now you can see that we actually managed to express multi-set uh, operator using this universally quantified formula. This was real, this form, universally quantified formulas are very neat because we can actually also express properties like sets or, uh, or a subset uh, uh, and uh, uh, equality, but what, for example, for subset, we would just say, well, for every element, this element appeared less or equal time in one multi than in another. But nice, again, let me stress out why this for every E is important. It is because we can express things like this. For every E, element appears either once or two or zero times. Namely, we can actually express if it's uh, explicitly that something is a set. And now, of course, cardinality operator, the one which was causing all that trouble, you would uh, define cardinality operator as a pretty, pretty much as you expect, just run over all element, count how many day, times do they appear and add that. So those are operators that are important that we consider. And those were actually operators that would arise for verification conditions that we consider. But as you can see, our language is pretty uh, rich and expressive. Now, I told you already, I did a spoiler alert in the beginning, that this language is decidable. And decision procedure will go actually into two steps. In the first step, we take formula in this MAPA logic, which stands for multisets with Presburger arithmetic. If you know Victor's work, this is a really much paying homage of the, on, to his uh, BAPA logic, which stands for Bal uh, Boolean algebra and Presburger arithmetic. So BAPA was to reason about uh, sets with cardinalities, and this is now multisets for cardinalities. So we take a formula in this MAPA logic, we will reduce it to something that we call Lea star, and then I will show you how to take get rid of the star and come to pretty, uh, sim a simple linear integer arithmetic formula where you can call your uh, favorite uh, solver for linear integer arithmetic. So instead of giving you one big uh, algorithm and uh, explain it like all what Greek symbols, symbols means, let me actually guide you through example. And an example that you see is a very simple one. What I'm trying to show is like, I take two multisets X and Y, and I put them into this joint union. And I say like cardinality of this disjoint union is the same as cardinality of I take of X and cardinality of Y and then I sum test values. So to prove that this formula is valid, we will actually negate it and we try to show that opposite is uh, the negation is unsatisfiable. And now um, what we do, we first do, some, uh, which, which push, we first do something which you're all familiar, something that looks similar to purification. We will take all complicated expressions and kind of make them as simple as possible by introducing fresh variables. So first thing will be, okay, we have here complicated expression, which says like uh, we have cardinality operator applied on the something complicating. So we pull this out and then we will get the new uh, multiset variable, which will tell you, oh, this is just cardinality of M0 and my M0 is equal X plus Y. Next step will be, we see that there is a cardinality operator op uh, which is integer op, uh, applied to multisets. So we actually want to get rid of, uh, again, simplify that and pull out these cardinality operators and get this to be only linear integer arithmetic formula, which it is. So what we are getting here, we're introducing two new integer variables and this formula becomes k0 is not equal k1 plus k2 and we keep uh, definitions here. So now here is where we are. And what we will now do, we will, uh, 
this is the end of purification. So all uh, we have a pure linear integer arithmetic formula and everything else is very simple. So what we will now do, but we, uh, we will uh, introduce definitions. So we will apply definitions of cardinality operator and uh, a disjoint union operators, the ones that you have seen a couple of slides back. So Pressburger arithmetic formula stays, and I see k0 is sum over all e, k1 is again sum, and so on. And what I also, uh, what this means, the disjoint union, again, I say that is for every e, m0, v is uh, by e of plus x e. Nothing but applying definitions here. And now what we will do, we will actually group those some vectors, uh, some some uh, atoms into a vector. So the reason why we do that, because uh, I need to come to a special normal form that we will use to convert into via star formula. So what we can then get will be a pure linear integer arithmetic formula. Then we group all these vectors, some vectors into some uh, uh, parts into a vector, and then the universally quantified parts stay. So what uh, what I want to show you now is this some normal form, which actually says that every multiset formula in this expressive language that I showed you can actually be reduced to this some normal form. And some normal form has three parts. First, first is a pure linear integer arithmetic or Pressburg arithmetic. So this is the this part here. The second part is this uh, uh, sum. A vector, which is actually summarizing over all elements of uh, 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 of E, and actually that's something that looks as follows. And the third part is universally quantified. Now this conversion is pretty simple. It's just rewrite techniques. It's in a couple of our papers, and it's actually done in linear time. So every multi formula that you have seen can be reduced to this form. And now. Since now I have this beautiful form, it's time actually to introduce Lea star formula, Lea star logic, because what I want to do is now take this formula in the some normal form and reduce it to Lea star formula. So to introduce Lea star, I first want to tell what is a star operator applied to the set of integer vectors. So this is nothing but linear combination of all these vectors. Like for example, if you look at 10, and start operating to 10 will be 0, 10, 20, 30. Now, if you look at 3 at 10, that will again be linear combinations of all possible values. So it will be 0, 3, 6, 9, then it's all the one that you see afterwards. After 19 comes 20 because it's 10 plus 10 and so on. Now, important is once we have this star operator to, in the set of vectors, we will also use a plus, which will actually just take every element and increase it for the value uh, uh, for the vector that is here. But you will see why is this important. Now, having a star operator over the set, we can also consider the following. If I have formula F and I find a set of all solutions, can we apply a star operator? Of course we can, because I never put here restriction that it has to be only set of a finite set of vectors. So we can easily take all the solutions of formula F and apply the star operator. And we denote this with F star. By F star, we will actually mean set of all uh, vect all values, which are when we find a set of solution of F and then we apply, but, and then we, uh, and then we apply the, and then we apply the star operator on the set of all solutions. Now, looking here, but when we will say f star of y, that will actually just be, I'm asking if y is element of, uh, element of that set. Now, let's go to see some pictures. Pictures are always good. So um, I have now f, which actually consists of two vectors, one and uh, one, one and one, zero. And then f star will be all linear combinations. If, remember, it's, we are not in the reals, we are in integers. So it's not everything which is within this vector, it's all integers within this light shaded uh, part because that can be uh, described as a linear combination of those two vectors. So for example, if I take one, one, one two, and one, one, and I add that, I will get two, three, two, three, and this is somewhere here. So this vector, this integer vector will be within F star. So this we call denote with F star. Remember, for now, since I will always kind of, at least in my, I always pictured myself whenever I talk about star as a bunch of vectors, and then the vector, uh, then it's a cone generated from that set of vectors. So Leah star actually asks the following. Is if, if I give you formula F, can you find uh, X, which is element of this F star? And 
in addition that x satisfies some constraints from, given by another linear integer arithmetic formula g. So in this particular case, if this vector here can be written and, uh, in, uh, as a linear combination of 1, 2, and 1, 1, then we know that this is a solution of our uh, given constraints. Now, formally defining, this is exactly what Leah star is. It is a formula where we have two quantifier free linear integer arithmetic formulas, P and F. We take all the solutions of F, then we apply star operators again, like big cone, probably infinite cone, but you know, it's hard to picture infinity. And then we check whether this vector U is element of that cone and whether it also satisfies formula P. So you can actually ask, is this some artificial uh, logic? Who cares? But when we introduced this logic, we didn't really know much. I mean, this was just uh, about this logic. This was just logic that was useful for us. But uh, and we managed actually to show uh, 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 this ability of multisets with cardinality constraints. But recently, uh, this logic and that type of logic has gained lots of interest in other fields. So, for example, this paper was published last year at Clix. And they actually considered these uh, various aspects of the star operator. They actually looked into nested stars. We will have F star and G and then all these stars. And actually, they showed that this logic is very used, for example, for vector addition systems and others. So if you would like to know more about the star, please look into this paper, very interesting paper, and decide. So this is great. So if you look now, go back to our problem, which was going from MAPA to Leah star, this is the formula where we stop, right? We had this uh, formula that we reduced to something which we call the sum normal form. And I'm saying that this formula is equisatisfiable with a Leah star formula, which can actually be more or less just uh, rewritten in one single step. So what we do, Pressburg arithmetic part stays the same. K, uh, K vector now becomes, uh, instead of being uh, uh, equal, equal, equality becomes checking whether it's element of this set and the uh, universally quantified part actually becomes the part or over which we want to find solutions. So maybe now this looks, how do you do come that? It, the proof is very straightforward because if you think about what we are saying here is like, we say, well, it is linear, uh, U is linear combinations of these vectors P and they're actually satisfied some properties because those are multiplicity functions which actually hold for every element. Well, this is more or less exactly what Leah Stars is saying because this is actually this, it like it's a linear combination. So depending how many elements you find from here, this will actually tell you how many elements are in the set E. So actually that's it. It's you know like very nice. We came from a multisets uh, with cardinality constraints in a single linear right step to, uh, uh, to this uh, some normal form. And then we actually just had to do this one switch and we are in Leah star. So for the rest of the talk, until we reach uh, uh, evaluation, I will talk about Leah star because this one was actually a little, this logic was a little bit more complicated. It wasn't as uh, simple as uh, linear integer arithmetic. And uh, to get rid of the star operator, we use something which is called uh, semi-linear sets. So semi-linear sense, some of you are known, some of them are not. So let me recall the definition. Semi-linear set is a finite union of a linear set. And a linear set is something that you have already seen. So this, for a linear set, you need to have a finite set of integer vectors. So, you know, like now we are in the finite number of them and you create this star operator and then you actually shift it for uh, some uh, other vector. So if you look, there are two examples of linear sets. One you have already seen like two plus 10 star, it's 12, uh, 12 uh, 22 and so on. And notice that I can describe this with the some linear integer uh, arithmetic formula, all exit all here. If I take another example, you can also see that I can describe all X and Y, which are part of this linear set, again, with linear integer arithmetic formula. So again, picture, because with pictures, we can easily picture what is happening. Like what we have is set B, this big B, which is actually set of finite set of generators. So again, this is creating a cone. And now we have this one single vector, which we call shift vector of a, or offset vector, which is kind of like pushing cone toward that some direction. So this is a linear set. And then semi-linear set will be a finite union of such linear sets. 
So why are they important? There, there are two important theorems. One is actually that says that if I take any linear integer arithmetic formula, we can find a set of its solution as a semi-linear set. Actually, they talk about Pressburger arithmetic, but it can easily be twi uh, twisted so that we talk about linear integer arithmetic. So this is not our results, that's an old result from 60s, worked by Innsbruck and Spanier, who actually showed that it also goes the other way around. If you take a semi-linear set, it's a set, uh, set of vectors which are satisfying this, which are belonging to semi-linear set, can actually be described as a linear integer arithmetic formula. So now let's go, what does it mean? This is a formula that we had, right? M0 is equal y plus x. And here we are in luck because uh, we computed linear sets. Let me put this on the side how. And it turns out that linear set is actually set that has zero as an offset vector. So it's just something that is coming from the zero point. And it has the following three, uh, the following two vectors as generator. So I won't prove that, but if you just want to sanity check and see whether indeed, indeed this holds, let me take a trip. Uh, a tuple 4 to 2, you see that 4 is equal to 2 plus 2. Is this indeed the case? Yes, I can write it as a 0 plus 2 times one vector plus 2 times another vector. Uh, now, this is really nice result because then what we showed was that if we take uh, some F formula F star X, and we know that uh, there is a semi-linear representation of X, there is a semi-linear set representing all solution of X, then we can actually get rid of the star and create a pure linear integer arithmetic formula. Again, let me show you this on the example. So this is where we stopped, right? I know that I have here, uh, I want to find all the solutions of that, uh, all M0, Y, and X, which are satisfying this formula. So we are in the luck because we have a very nice linear set describing all this solution. So every M0, Y, and X that I consider have the following form. Now, if K, is linear combination of this M0 by and K, then I can actually write it, you know, like K times some of, uh, like, I don't know, uh, some certain number of them, of them, but I can actually add them. And I will turn out that at the end, it will have this following form. It will be one zero one times some number plus one one zero times some number and two. Well, this is really great because that means we managed to get rid of the star operator, right? And uh, this brings us now that we can actually complete our example. We started with the Pressburger arithmetic, uh, with the MAPA formula. We came to the linear integer arithmetic with the star operator. And using this semi-linear characterization, we managed to get rid of the star operator and we have a pure linear integer arithmetic formula. All these transformations are satisfiability preserving. So you can immediately see this formula is unsatisfiable, meaning that our original formula was actually also a worse value the one that we started with. Now, looking at that, I actually, there is even in our paper, you can see like a recipe, how you do that. You actually uh, take reduced multiset formula to this normal form, then we find semi-linear set and so on. And what I wanted to tell you is like, I did kind of trick you. I told you, oh, you just take a semi-linear set. Like this is the most natural thing to compute, you know, like, oh, let me compute semi-linear set. But the problem is it's really hard thing to find. So and in addition, there can be, very large number of the of these uh, generators, namely exponential. So if you look at here, let me assume that they found semi-linear sets for uh, for f. So it will, I will uh, consider this a is the offset vector and b are those vectors which are uh, a generator. So each a has a finite number of associated b's. And now you, uh, when we eliminated the star operator, we we had a very nice formula, very simple formula, and that was due to the fact that our offset vector was zero, right? So that was, we were pretty lucky. But in the real life, that is not really a big deal because then you will again have, uh, remember, all these, those are concrete values. Those are not variables, right? So those are concrete vectors. So I will be, I will show that U is linear combination of these vectors with additional constraints that says like, well, if some offset vector doesn't uh, appear, then also it's associated vectors which are associated with cannot appear. And then once we get this formula, we just check its satisfiability. Now, problem is, uh, as I already told you, how can we compute semi-linear sets? Hard. Uh, second is like, uh, how many generators we might need? Exponentially many. So for this, this means that we will we have a potential to consider actually here uh, 
next time this next time complete decision procedures which is really too complicated you know like for just counting you want to immediately go one complexity class higher but uh, what you maybe know, if you look into Victor Spaffa's paper, you will see that he's a master of showing that, some, that something actually doesn't need all this exponential representation, that it's enough to consider uh, linear, uh, that it's, it's enough to consider polynomial in many uh, vectors needed. So if I take any u, excuse me, if I take any u vector that I need to show as a linear combination of these vectors, it I will have then bunch of A's, bunch of correlated B's, but you know, like, although there is, uh, all I want to know, I want to show you is, although there is exponentially many generators, we still don't need all of them. It's enough to consider polynomially many. So let me show you what, what is the trick for that. So before I explain you the theorem that you see, consider that, uh, consider that we are not right now in integers and consider if we are just in the case of the, of the standard, uh, 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 rational numbers. So if I have a vector of rational vectors and I have a cone, which is, you know, I if I have a cone of, of rational vectors and I look a vect a one vector which is generating from vectors in that cone, I don't really need to consider all of the cones. I just need to consider D of them. There is actually D is a dimension of the problem. So in this particular case, we are in 2D, we need only consider two of them. Now, now let's look, what, what does it mean uh, in for integers? For integers, because remember, we are, if you look at here, we are constantly trying to show our U is linear combination of these vectors. So it is generated from some vectors from the cone. So looking here, that means that uh, there is this work by uh, Friedrich Eisenberg and Gennady Schmonin who actually showed like, okay, for the integer case, D is not enough. For the integer case, you will need to consider D but you also need to know what is the maximal value appearing there. So the great thing is like, if we would manage to compute then this maximal value and this D, and then it will, it will show like, okay, that's great because then we don't need to consider all of those vectors. It's enough to consider this number which can be computed and this is exponentially many of them. So without really going how this algorithm is working, let me actually show you what we showed. We actually showed the following. So great. We took this uh, prop, uh, theorem of uh, uh, Gennady, Schmonin, and uh, Friedrich Eisenberg, and we actually computed the number of generators that we need. So it turns out we need, uh, uh, and if n is the size of the formula, we need O of n log n, but this number Q is not some, you know, like theoretical, uh, like a, a, a theoretical number. It is a real concrete number that we can compute. So it's really a number, which is, it will depend on the dimension of the problem, the size of the biggest, uh, the biggest value appearing in the generators, but you say like, oh, well, you still need to compute seven linear sets. We don't, because actually just to answer this uh, number, we actually used the old work by uh, Lloyd Potier, who actually showed that there is a bound on the number of the, on the size of the semi of the generators of seven linear sets without actually computing them. You look at the formula you, and from the formula, you can already compute what will be the biggest the biggest vector in the semi-linear sets? So going back here, so we now have this concrete value Q. So we, and not only that, we actually show that you don't really need to compute all these AI and BI vectors, right? We actually need to just get solutions. So if you look, here is like, we say like U is linear combination of the solutions. I don't actually talk anymore about generators. So this was really great because now if you think about what we have now is like we have uh, Q, which is a concrete value that we need to compute. So it's like, let's say 20,000. And we actually know that we actually need to just guess 20,000 vectors satisfying formula F. And then we actually know that U is linear combination of those vectors. Except, of course, you can say, but you have here linear combination. Yes, that is a large last hurdle that we did. But then again, we use Papa Dimitrios' uh, solution, which says, like, well, if there is a solution, then it's a small solution. So we bounded that. And at the end, using all these things, we actually managed to show that the problem was uh, indeed belonged to MP complete class. So what actually also caused that, that by a senior member of community, I was called an MP abuser, saying like, wow, who can actually, you really abuse, we guess, we guess, we guess. And this is really true because 
I could first try to implement this smart NP algorithm. And more or less, my reaction was, as you can see on the picture, that was uh, actually it was, it was an exhibition in Vienna dedicated uh, to uh, MOOC. And uh, I implemented, uh, I tried this, and it really didn't work because you, there was really too many guessing involved. So if, but we went one step back, and we looked like, OK, so maybe then let's try to compute semilinear sets. Like, as you, some of you know, computing semilinear sets is not really an easy task. But however, it was relatively simple for the problems that we considered. And those were problems which were, because at that time, we tried to uh, plug MOOC as a, a solver for the problems coming from verification of the container data structures. So we uh, actually, that was my last talk at Ichikar was actually really uh, showing the MOOC tool. So we had that tool, which was uh, incomplete. However, decision procedure was complete, but it was incomplete implementation because the only thing that was missing was this semi-linear set computation. So it was implemented in Scala. It was uh, working relatively well for these problems that were coming from verification, but the problem was it didn't really scale. First was problem was lack of uh, benchmarks. And the second one was like all these benchmarks were relatively simple, right? It would be, oh, I now want to insert one element in the list. I want to insert two elements in the list. Now I want to three, now four. So you could easily see that that would cause the set uh, solver to go off in full exponential uh, blow up because, you know, like you would have to do so many cases. But we would just like, okay, I insert one more. That's just one uh, constant, different constant. So that was nice. But nevertheless, when you tried something different, like something that wasn't really like insertion or deletion of the elements, it didn't really scale. And uh, to make it scale, we actually needed to really wait 10 years. That, uh, that was uh, last year that we started that work. And uh, let me now tell you what was the solution. The solution was like, like always in the life, be lazy. Don't, don't do everything at the same time. Because if you look at the decision procedure, which was beside behind MOOC, right, it was the following. Take formula, take go to the real star. Okay, that's all this part remains. But then what we would do was like compute semi-linear sets and then construct this big monolithic formula that corres that is equisatisfiable to a given formula. And now, you know, like call the, the tool on that. So this was a bit, you know, like very complicated. And the formulas that we would, you know, like for a simple, it's very simple problems we would uh, uh, derive them would really be enormous. So let's now step back and look actually what we are trying to solve. And let's actually try to be lazy. So we are, but again, what is Lea star? We have F, which is describing some set of solution. And then on all this set of solution, we apply star operator. So if it holds F2 of X, that means that X is actually linear combination. I can really write it down. Like X is equal, you know, like, uh, let's say five vectors, five vectors, a linear combination of five vectors, and each of these vectors is actually satisfying F2. And now what we want to do is like, now just check this F, whether it's actually part of F1. Remember our previous approach was like, really count how many vectors you need and then just construct this big monolithic formula. But maybe we don't really need that many vectors. Maybe it's already one or two enough. So what we are doing is we are going to F2 and we are trying to approximate F2, this uh, triangle, both from below and from above. And uh, practically, laziness this time really paid off. I hope there are no students in the audience. So let's now go look at what I mean by over approximation and under approximations. So going back to what I just said, like maybe we just need one or two vectors. So what we will do is like, imagine we have this uh, triangle here and the dark part is a, uh, uh, this darker part is uh, uh, under approximation. So if we manage to find some under approximation, maybe I find like, let's say, I find two or three values which are, come, which are enough to uh, be solutions of F2, and then their linear combination is equal X, and this F1 satisfies X, uh, this X satisfies F1. Then, and this we show that this is satisfied, then, then this is satisfiable and we are done. So we actually don't really care about the full uh, scope of the, you know, like everything that is there in semi-linear set or, uh, or uh, approximations of F2. 
uh, in, in the whole F2 star, because why would we care if we managed to find a simple description of some sorts of under approximations, and that was enough to show us the problem is satisfiable. And we know that this will terminate, because if you remember, the proof was like, I know that there are many of them, but this number I can still compute, and believe me, this number is really large. It doesn't work in practice, even for the most simple formula. But however, we know that it's polynomial, and we will enumerate all of them, and we know that we will terminate, and that's great. However, that's really not what will work well in practice, right? Because most of the problems are valid, which means when you negate them, they are unsatisfiable. So this is not really a great approach. So what we do also is like not only that we go find a solution with under approximations, but we also go for the other part, find a somehow over approximation. So now let's assume that there is no solution. The problem is unsatisfiable. So we have F1 and F2 star, which are actual, but they do not overset. So what I want to do, if I find some over approximations in the form of interpolant, which actually kind of separates, uh, uh, which encapsulates F2 star, but it still doesn't intersect with F1, then we know that the original problem is unsatisfiable. So more or less, that's the, that's the approach. Be lazy. Start. Let me show you the let me show you the how the whole uh, procedure looks like. It actually goes as follows. We start with uh, some basic under approximations, which will just be empty semilinear set, and over approximation is like we just encapsulate everything. Then, assuming that we already found some under approximation, then we will say like is uh, can we refine it? And if this in, is now the problem is satisfiable. If it is satisfiable, we are done. We are out. However, if if it's not, then we go and try to refine over approximation. And again, if it's satisfiable, if it's not, if it's unsatisfiable, again, we know that we are done. And if not, we repeat the process and that's it. So now let me actually show you how these over approximations and under approximations are working. And then I will tell uh, uh, that we'll have to just, just briefly outline if you would like to know more, there are, uh, I will gladly answer. But now let me, and then I will tell you more about uh, evaluation. So under approximation is very simple. Uh, what we do is the following. So imagine you already have some under approximation and then what you will ask is by Lia or Oracle, I actually mean any, your favorite decision procedure for linear integer arithmetic will be the following. I will, we will ask, well, give me some solution to F2 that is not linear combination of these things that we already have. So this solution that we will get will be some maybe this vector here. Now, if you think about this, is this practically when you start, you just say, give me a solution. Second one will be, give me a solution that is not linear combination of the other. And you practically just kind of repeat this process, right? So we are, we are kind of trying to all the time find a new, new, uh, a new vector that is satisfying a formula F2. You can see that we are not going actually into F2 star. I mean, we are just trying to describe F2 star by asking for more and more solutions. So this is uh, not very, you know, like a simple problem, but then uh, when we find a solution, we add it to our already existing semi-linear set. And now what we do is we actually take, we say, okay, I already have my, uh, constructed under approximation. So I say X is, those are concrete vectors. Those are not, you know, some uh, variables. So I say like X is linear combination of these concrete vectors. And does, is there exist X, which is linear combination of this, and it satisfies F1? If yes, great, we are done. If not, well, we will repeat the process. But now also, this, uh, I mean, we could, we could do that and it would be fine, but I just want to show you that it's not as simple as that. We also kind of did some sorts of, uh, there are a couple of reductions in the paper, did four or five of them, that actually shows which reductions we do apply to consolidate. So we, that, don't, we have somehow uh, smoother, uh, like smaller representation of semi-linear sets, for example. And uh, if you look at what we have here is actually we always check to kind of keep it under control, that they don't go and retain, that they don't go incredibly high. You always remember that those are linear combinations, right? So if you have something that is too big, just reduce, uh, you know, like one from another, and you will again get the same uh, semi-linear set, because if you want to have this big big vector that you had in the beginning, it is just linear combination of the smaller ones. So those are just kind of to keep things same and that they don't explode easily. So this was under approximation. So what would be then over approximation? So over approximation, as I said, would be, let's actually find interpolant. So in this particular case, so it goes like this, right? I have my 
have to have to start and I'm trying like can is it satisfiable not well maybe if it's not now if it's not satisfiable by now let me try to construct it so what in ideal case what we would want to have would be we, we kind of take discretion of f to star and not f1 we call any of our interpolant solvers and it will tell you oh here's your interpolant except that of course we don't have f to star right this is the whole point that we are trying to avoid but what we do have is f to star approximation so this is this dark triangle that you see here so we can ask now for some approximation some interpolant be between this f to star approximations that we already computed and f1. So we might get interpolant. As you, you can already see, this is not a good interpolant, but it is somehow, inter but this interpolant for something that we already have. So, you know, like this interpolant we can compute. So what we are doing is like, we call here a tool, we get interpolant, but this is not, uh, but just to all say like, uh, this is not really good. Why? Because it's not inductive. But we can easily check once we have interpolant, we can easily check inductiveness by simply saying, okay, you have interpolant, now check if it holds that I have this interpolant and I take any solution to, to F2, I will still remain in the interpolant and well, this is inter indeed interpolant from F1. Now, uh, of course you can say, but wait, F2, don't you talk about F2 star? Yes, but you don't remember what is F2 star. F2 star is actually generated by solution uh, is, uh, F to star is a set, which is linear combination combination of the vectors which are here generated from F to solutions. So that that we are fine if uh, if we indeed found uh, interpolant which satisfies that, then it's also interpolant on F to star. However, as again, I don't have. Uh, if you would look into the paper, we have uh, many uh, optimizations here because you know, like this. Uh, in order to make this uh, working well in practice, uh, you probably know that we use C3, and C3 is based in space, which is not complete. So we actually have to uh, collect all the clauses that we derive through the uh, through the board, and then we do linear combinations. However, uh, we shot a uh, completeness of our, of our approach. Another, there is uh, many uh, optimizations here that actually uh, uh, Max kind of came with the theory. If you look what we are doing here, right? We, we found our approximations and then we found interpolant. But sometimes you want to find more vectors kind of to push this interpolant more to the side. So he called this unfolding. And actually, it turns out this unfolding that uh, could sometimes uh, much uh, speed up the whole process of uh, finding uh, in, uh, uh, in a proper uh, inductive interpolant. So to tell you more and conclude, um, tell you more about implementations, it is implemented. It's not called MOOC, actually. I don't even know how to be called. It's some random name. Uh, it's publicly available. Uh, so, uh, and it also involves uh, this translation from APA to LIA star. And uh, you can actually, if you look at this uh, uh, GitHub repository of Max, you will both see tool and benchmarks and you can even play with your own and uh, extend it and uh, maybe even give us some more challenging benchmarks. So, so this, since it actually has uh, this translation from Alpha Star to Leah Star, so clearly this is now also a reasoner for multi-sets with cardinality constraints. One problem was, again, the one that they faced 10 years ago was that, you know, like we didn't have real multi-sets benchmarks, right? So if you look again back to my old Ishkar paper, like it was, it was just one table saying like, now insert one element, insert two elements, insert three elements, a fourth. You can see that it's almost the same behavior, so there was no point in checking for more of them. However, uh, uh, what was interesting was that we actually realized sometimes people would use BAPA, which is Boolean algebra with Pressburg arithmetic, which is reasoning about sets, simply because there is BAPA implementation and there is no MAPA implementation. So we looked at, uh, in the work of Sharon Shonan and her collaborators, and uh, they gave us very nice benchmarks, which actually use BAPA. There were over 240 benchmarks where they use uh, BAPA as a logic for modeling uh, distributed protocols. So this, then we actually took those benchmarks and look at them as a uh, map of benchmarks. And we, of course, we had our own benchmarks, which were actually just uh, benchmarks that we created when we were uh, running uh, uh, like testing and so on. So on overall, we actually solved over 83% in the 50 seconds. So you can say, 50. well, we were pretty happy because it first there is, it is working. And actually, if you think about machinery behind it, it's pretty complex. So it's solving it within 
all, all these benchmarks within uh, 83 seconds is pretty great. And uh, even better, like majority of benchmarks were actually solved under three seconds. So that's really nice. Uh, our tool, what we can observe now is that it's effective both on the set and on some benchmarks simply because, you know, like uh, we, we didn't kind of focus on only one part under approximations and over approximations work well. And actually uh, all these uh, reductions uh, that I showed you, the, well, one, I'll show you only one, actually they severely limit the size of the same linear sets. Of course, when we look at the problem, sometimes, you know, like there is lots of heavy machinery for which we just throw or call solver, call solver. Sometimes we had uh, more than 100 uh, invocations of solvers uh, per formula. Now, uh, when we run to show you, you know, like what kind of experiments if you don't see graphs, so to give you graphs, uh, we ran experiments into four uh, different classes. We sort of treated all benchmarks as the buffer problems, what they are. Then we treated them as a multisys problems just to see how do they scale. And then this unfold that they told you, let's try to just like unfold things to find, uh, unfold uh, vectors to find uh, interpol and faster. Then which I wanted to say, if we, if we do up to five unfolding, how faster is through. And then we said like, okay, uh, now let's actually see what if we turn uh, interpolation of how things will work well. Then uh, to give you also the flavor of the benchmarks, uh, more than 100 of them had uh, six uh, multi-set or other free variables or set variables. There were those who had uh, a little bit more, actually here is distribution, but there are also those a bit larger who had more than uh, 10 multi-set variables. And it was also to tell you like uh, in the old days, BAPA, the reason is they would actually die approximately around four, uh, six variables. And that was uh, how much they could scale. So now looking back, uh, that was when I was uh, comparing that to the MATLAB. So looking back, how did we work? Actually, we saw that uh, uh, if you look at the MAPA, uh, BAPA, you can see that there is this, as the problems get larger, there is tendency that uh, that solutions uh, uh, times will almost, you can see exponential growth. And the reason for that is somehow it didn't come as a surprise to us because if you look, we need to take explicitly that every set is actually a set variable. So, and stating that something is a set was actually saying like either S of E is zero or S of E is one. So, you know, like we know that there is this disjunction and exponential blob was somehow lurking in the corner. We knew it will happen. However, if you look and we treat this only as a map, as multisets, things are actually relatively tame, right? So they don't, it doesn't really immediately go to its full exponential blob. So, um, Coming to the unfold, we can see that for a smaller benchmarks, it really works as a miracle. For a little bit larger, we can't really see that much. It, we can see it's uh, learning ties are, or average lower, but not that uh, drastically. Now, if you look at problems which are somehow reasonable that for kind of of these 10 to 16 uh, variables, uh, that is uh, 10 to 16 variables, uh, timeout was 50 uh, milliseconds, no, 50 seconds, so that was uh, less than a minute. That was actually the, uh, the, the class of the, in between which we managed to solve the most of the problems. And you can see that uh, this, uh, that when we took, when we didn't use interpolation, then in that case, we didn't solve anything unsatisfiable. It would just stand out. So clearly interpolation and this over approximations was very important approach. And if you just would like to know how big were these generators and semi-linear size, they were also kind of always under, we needed less than 20 vectors. So to conclude, thank you for your time. Uh, I presented you uh, some logic that was maybe unfairly overlooked in the, our community, it's multisets with cardinality constraints. You can see, I mean, more or less logic is, has the uh, same complexity results as uh, sets. So, you know, like for the same money, you get way more expressivity. I also uh, outlined you this new linear alias star logic, which was uh, very crucial for establishing our uh, decidability results. And then at the end, I outlined how our uh, uh, efficient tool for reasoning about sets and multisets with cardinality constraints is working. Again, answer, be lazy. And, uh, you know, like uh, we, we kind of managed to do that without really going to this prohibitive cost of computing semi-linear sets. So that was great. And we really 
uh, evaluated on the existing benchmarks, so not on the benchmarks that uh, were tuned for us. So I'm really happy to take uh, to stop here and take your questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Rita. So now it's time for a questioning. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of time, so please either post your question in question and answer or raise your hand. Maybe people, are, while people might type their question, I mean, you, you say that for the same money, you get the same expressivity, just like no, more expressivity. <laughs> yeah, more, but you get less scalability, right? So, well, actually, uh, not really, because when we looked, uh, uh, I mean, it's really working nice. I mean, uh, this, of course, all implementation, which was constricting this monolithic approach, you know, like, let's we take problem convert, con construct it to the one uh, large formula, it, uh, it didn't actually scale. But if you look now, how is it working with this lazy approach, like trying to over approximate and under approximate and, uh, you know, like aiming towards, you know, like it's kind of take, if you take F step going to the board, it really works much better than, you know, like, uh, than we, I mean, it's it's working really nicely. And uh, it, it, it's no longer that, you know, like it's, uh, it's kind of put to the shame from up. It actually works much faster for uh, multis, uh, for multis now. There is one question uh, mm -hmm. from Sophie today. So she's actually asking in the experiment without interpolation. Yeah, this is also my question. Actually. Although no answer problems were solved, more sub problems were solved. So do you know the reason or can you explain the reason? Uh, so the reason uh, was, uh, uh, let me recall. So I believe, I mean, uh, the, let, I kind of didn't look into this, but I believe the reason would actually be because uh, you you know like since you didn't you didn't use interpolation you actually didn't pay, uh, use all this time remember it the reason is why it was more solved because we put strict timeout to the 50 seconds so uh using interpolation gives additional requirement that you are always calling uh z3 you know like okay now let me check this and uh, so if you don't have uh this requirement to uh, to call Z3 to do all linear combination of the found causes to kind of compute interpolant, you actually get kind of free time for, you know, like, give me more solution, give me more solutions. So I assume that would be the answer. I didn't really look into that, but looking at decision procedures, that's, that's the only explanation I see. Thank you. And then Rene uh, Thiemann is asking, uh, whether is it so is it correct that uh, your interpolation based approach is also usable to generate small certificates of unsat yes because we actually i mean all you have we could e easily uh, because once you find a certificate we could just kind of print it out that that is true we, we could really do found this uh, we do find this interpolants and we could then uh, print them out i mean i don't think we don't even print them now but that's just one print line uh, one question further then, uh, but uh, is it the case, uh, how how difficult is it to check that these are really interpolants, etc.? So, so if that you the look, mm -hmm. Quietly. So practically, uh, checking that something is interpolant is enough really to check the following. This is the, this is a formula that we need to check. Because you can say now, why, why are you considering only F2 and not F2 star? Because F2 star is a linear combination of, uh, of uh, vectors from F2, and this is just definition of inductiveness. Okay. So okay. That, that, sure. Thank you. And then one more question from Karl uh, Panskog. So is there an obvious way to integrate your approach with proof assistant like talk or Isabel? And their respective multiset libraries. I mean, that was your original motivation, right? In your first slide. No, my original motivation was try to show, oh, no, you know, like, yeah. And then when we searched for the, yeah, like try to try to show that you don't really need such large <laughs> verification conditions. But uh, 
I, I, I never actually, I cannot really answer that question honestly because I never integrated. I mean, I did play a little bit with Isabel back there because I was looking at their multisets library and then I tried to see, well, maybe we need to call Isabel. And uh, you need to know, it's also, it was 10 years ago when I was playing with Isabel. I didn't try with Cox, all right? Uh, in the meanwhile, all uh, uh all the, uh, both Isabel and Koch got way more uh, open to integration with SMT solvers. So looking back at my 10 years old, younger self, I would probably say, oh, wow, it's impossible. But uh, to be, but looking back to the all things that have done and uh, how, uh, how much integration still we have, I think it would be interesting to see. I'm pretty sure that now it would be much easier uh, than uh, it was previously. But, you know, like I, I, I haven't done that, and uh, so I have to really kind of need to look more into details. So I see no more questions, but also time is up. Uh, but oh. you already have your fan club in your the chat. People like the talk, and they really thank for you. And oh. I want to thank for the very nice oh, energy talk. Oh, thank, so thank you, you very much. much. And just, yeah. Well, I hope to see you all at next Ichkar. So <laughs> then we will talk more about Maltese. Bye then. Okay. Bye, Bye then.